Howdy, ladies and gentlemen, this is Lars Schall, and on behalf of Matterhorn Asset Management, I am now directly connected with the foreign exchange trading desk of the Bremer Landesbank in Germany, and I am now connected with the chief analyst of the Bremer Landesbank, Volker Hellmeier. Hi, Volker. Hi, Lars. Good to hear you. Um, now, I should mention, dear listeners, that we record our conversation on Friday, September 18, 2015, and I mention this because yesterday the Federal Reserve in the United States decided to leave interest rates unchanged. So, nothing new in the West, you could say. Does this come as a surprise to you, Volker, or was this already anticipated in your annual forecast for 2015? We did forecast in particular that there won't be a real turn in the interest rate environment in the U.S. A, as uh, the Fed said last year that towards 2017, the interest rates will be up, the federal funds rate up to 253%. We said no go area <clears throat> at its best, and that's what, what, what still seems possible. We may see something like a dent on the interest rate side towards 0.50%. Uh, but uh, not a uh, real change in the interest rate policies. And we also said that we will probably be talking about QE4 in the fourth quarter 2015. And in fact, um, good sources in the U.S. are exactly starting this discussion about QE4 now. And uh, why would you say it is impossible for the Fed to, um, uh, for an interest rate hike? Well, the main problem is that the USA has got an, a consumption-driven economy. 70% of the GDP of the U.S. is correlated with consumption. Now, when we look at the U.S. consumer, then we have to determine uh, how healthy is his position. And the uh, fact is the nominal income of the uh, U.S. median household has increased since 2008 by 4% whereas the um, consumption loans have increased by 28%. Given this situation, we have to clearly point out that the consumption-driven growth in the past was uh, loan-driven and not income-driven. And in that respect, the turn in the interest rate cycle would mean that the U.S. consumption will be hampered going forward, running the risk of a recession of the USA, and uh, as the Federal Reserve is determined to foster um, sustainable growth, basically they are in no position to change this in interest rate environment as long as the um, income levels are as dire as they are. Now, in the aftermath of the Fed decision, stocks rallied, bonds rallied, so did gold and silver while the dollar fell. Uh, no surprise here either? Well, yes and no. I'm not surprised on the dollar side because, I mean, um, one of the anchors of the dollar firmness of the past 18 months was the expectation of this turn in the interest rate cycle in the USA. And this is not happening, thus the sell-off in the U.S. dollar against the, on the currency side and the foreign exchange markets as well as against gold and silver makes sense. And is it, it was expected. Um, the situation with the bond markets also makes sense we are seeing uh, a new positioning by markets after this event where they seem to expect that uh, the bait of an interest rate change in October or December is not really being taken seriously. Thus, we are seeing here positioning, uh, expecting a longer-term benign interest rate environment in the USA as well as in Europe. That makes sense also. Um, the equity markets reacted quite uh, differently. First of all, they went up because, of course, now we still have honeymoon time with low interest rate environment in the whole West. But then we've seen a sell-off, and a quite market sell-off in particular today, also in Europe, where we lost roughly 3% in the DAX, for instance, or in the Euro stocks. And uh, given that situation... Uh, it, it also makes sense. First of all, a relief. Well, we keep the low in, in, uh, interest rate environment. But the second thought was also, well, it doesn't mean that the growth pattern of the U.S. economy is not um, matching the expectations. And that is reason for the sell-off. But I promise you, 
last, it will be also limited. We may see a sell-off. Markets are very volatile for a couple of days, but we will find a bottom because America has got a, an asset-driven economy. They, uh, the the uh, economic cycle depends also on the valuation of the real estate sector and the equity markets, and thus we will see, uh, in, in, in case of emergency, we will see covered intervention. Okay, but uh, will we see uh, more efforts to prop up those markets? Well, what I expect is, uh, as in the past, when uh, if equity markets are coming under strain, under, uh, under pain, then we will see very strange movements in the last hour, last minutes of trading in the U.S., where it's all being pulled up again. And this smells, of course, of action by the so-called branch protection team or in proper words, the Working Group on Financial Markets, which had been implemented in the late 80s by the government of Ronald Reagan. Yeah, and it includes um, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, so several member banks of the Federal Reserve, uh, in particular uh, in New York. And uh, yeah, pretty much these are the entities we are talking about. The GFTC or the SEC, so mm -hmm. those guys who have to control each other in a, in a real system of free markets, right? They control each other. Yeah. are hanging together in order, to, as Hank Paulson, as, a, as head of the, the Treasury said back in, I think it was in 2000, let me think about 2009, we said we are, we are sitting together to uh, find a common agenda, etc. I mean, this is basically giving up the uh, free market principle in the financial sector of the USA, this uh, uh, teamwork in the plunge protection team. Okay, Volker, let's talk about uh, conflict of interest here. Uh, when we talk about the Federal Reserve, we have to talk about uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and the member banks of the Federal Reserve, which are pretty much the owners of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, those member banks are um, those who hold um, the largest short position at COMEX in the gold market. Is this a conflict of interest? It is a conflict of interest. I mean, um, if you look at the textbook of, of the perfect market, it requires a poly-poly, so many, many participants. Also good for, as a shock-absorbing element. And what we see is that in U.S. Uh, um, future markets, in particular in the precious metal area, you have roughly five banks running the whole business. And they, that is a monopolistic oligopoly, and, of course, that means that the risk of manipulation, given that structure, is extremely high. And if you look then at the Working Group on Financial Markets and the um, very close ties between Treasury, Central Bank, and those New York City banks, then it's getting very obvious that these markets are being shifted around in a very, very funny way. I mean, if you look at the trading patterns of uh, precious metals throughout the last four and a half years, we've seen something which you haven't found in the history of financial markets given the market development. So that spells, uh, that, that flashes a red light on, on the free market principle in precious metals. Yeah, and when we talk about the short position of those banks, we have to address the problem that um, the price uh, finding is, uh, or the price discovery, is driven by the paper market at COGMEX. Indeed, yes, we have a split market in precious metals. I mean, it, it sounds a little bit like Russia back in 1980 regarding bread, right? I mean, you had an official bread price, but you could hardly buy any bread at that price. So the real price for bread outside was different. And it's a very funny thing that we're having, for example, in the silver business now, the COMEX price detection uh, scheme uh, runs at, let's say, $15.30 now, but outside for physical stuff uh, for coins like yeah, silver eagles, you pay in the U.S. a premium of up to 25%. I mean, it means that the uh, basically the price-finding mechanism at COMEX hasn't got to do anything with the physical market. But this, if we consider why do we have future markets and precious methods to improve the physical market, and what we're saying, seeing here is that the physical market is taken hostage by this future market, which is run by a couple of city banks in the U.S., this is out most ridiculous, in particular if you want to stand in for a free market principle. In the long run, would you say um, that you would be very bullish for gold? 
on the long run, I am. I've been bullish since 2001. I was one, one of the first chief analysts at the time at the Landesbank Hessen Thuringia in Frankfurt, uh, finding out about it. And saying, this is going to be in the four digits. And I was laughed at at the time we, when gold was 250. And I stick to that idea, though we had a long patch of of um, correction from 1900 down to below 1100 for, four, for the past four and a half years. This will change. Why will it change? Because smart money moves into this business, and smart money is located very much so now with China, with Beijing, with Moscow, in Russia, in India. They are buying the physical stuff. And basically, they see the, they they can buy to uh, to subsidized prices by the intervention, which is happening at the Comex in Chicago. So I'm very relaxed. You have to be an investor. Nobody can call a bottom here now. Maybe the bottom is already in, but if you have a medium-term goal in order to save money, which is nothing but saved work then it makes sense buying these corrections currently yeah, with a long-term or medium-term view as an investment. Is it very significant that in places like Beijing and Singapore, gold is uh, traded physically while it is in New York uh, traded primarily uh, in, on paper? Indeed, <clears throat> that is a context. I mean, paper markets are not necessarily bad as long as they support the physical markets and the functioning of these physical markets in the sense of the invisible hand of Adam Smith. Right? But this is no longer the case in the U.S. It, it is a case in the Far East physical markets, in particular in China, Hong Kong, and in that respect, these markets have, in my eyes, a much better standing given their market function than the COMEX, and they will prevail at the very end. Um, there's no doubt about it. Look, Lars, we have a situation where these emerging market countries are fed up with the West because we kind of constantly break our word. We are not sharing powers in the IMF and the World Bank because the U.S. denies it to these emerging market countries. They had a world GDP share of roughly 25% back in 1990. Now they are standing at 58%. They control. They, they are standing in for 85% of the world population. They control 70% of the world currency reserves, and now they emancipate themselves from the West by setting up a, a counter institution to the IMF, the New Development Bank, by setting up a counter institution to the World Bank, which is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, by setting up own payment systems in. Um, in, in, in competition to the SWIFT system, which was which was supposed to be abused against Russia, now they the Chinese set up SIPs. The Russian have a new system. They emancipate themselves. They build up a big physical gold uh, store, and that makes sense. And that will prevail. That will have the trend impact going forward if we have a time frame of three, five, or more years. Okay. Uh, however, China's uh, official gold position now, uh, do you think it is uh, rather ridiculous? <laughs> I think the Chinese know how to play statistics, right? Um, they are quite inventive. By the way, I think the economic statistics are more reliable than those of the U.S. Uh, there's a bit of a provocation. Um, but um, what they do with, the, with, with their gold holdings, their official gold holdings, I think, uh, is underreporting it by a large degree. When we look at really the numbers being shifted around in physical markets, imports, exports, production in China, uh, mainland itself, then these numbers may, do not make any sense. They, will, they are higher. They don't want this to be known. But eventually, when the time is right, they will tell the world in order to gain uh, credibility. Yeah. Uh, now, China, uh, with its uh, large uh, foreign exchange position, it used it uh, to um, to boost uh, the infrastructure project One Road, One Belt. And do you think um, that Russia, for example, and Germany are well advised to take uh, part in this uh, whole thing? <laughs> Indeed, yes. Um, I think it's the biggest economic bonanza ever since building the, the Chinese wall. It will have the biggest world economic impact in the next 10 to 20 years. It's setting up the infrastructure. It's not only the Silk Road, it's setting up the infrastructure from Moscow to Vladivostok to South China, South India, Pakistan, into Africa, and it also includes projects in South America. And what's happening is here, is, is one thing is building these roads, these railways, seaports, um, airports, etc. 
But that is a big issue because it's quantitative growth with a high uh, use of commodities. Like you need concrete, you need steel, you need copper, you need everything. So the low commodity prices, which are currently prevailing, won't prevail very much longer um, because we will see this in the statistics and the economic statistics setting up these things from next year, June onwards. Um, and it, but it's the second point. It's, it's not only a primary growth engine, it's a secondary and tertiary also because what is happening is that we will get hold of 1.5 billion people who are at the rim of the world economy due to a lack of infrastructure, which you pull into the middle of the world economy. So there's a secondary effect, a third effect, and that is smartness by the Chinese, by the Russians, by, and that is understood in Delhi, in India, it's understood in Brasilia. Um, and if we don't take part as Europe, as one of the leading export engines of the world, we will miss out on the biggest economic bonanza. And it's happening through sanctions, by the way, now against Russia. Siemens was supposed to uh, be part of the uh, railway um, from Moscow to Kazan. They dro were dropped out due to the sanctions. Alstom was designed to take part in the uh, high-speed railway from Moscow to Beijing, a $250 billion project. They were kicked out. The Chinese are doing it now, so don't underestimate the growth pattern going forward for China. So something is happening there, and if we drop out through unsensible foreign policies in the European Union and in Berlin, then we will pay a dire price of uh, uh, not taking part in potential growth patterns of the world economy. And now that you've talked about uh, the Ukraine, uh, do you think that the Europeans are shooting in their feet, uh, not just economically, but um, in more dimensions than this? Yes, I think so. And I had an interview last year on German uh, TV with uh, Frank Meyer from NTV, and it's called Wir werden am Ende den Preis bezahlen. It's still on, and people should look at that. It's nine minutes. I said, what's going to happen if we uh, go down this part of sanction furthermore? And all the forecasts I gave in that interview, it was in March 2014, uh, have, have turned into reality. So um, Berlin seems to be pretty much deaf as, as well as Brussels. And, but why is this the case? Don't ask me, don't uh, do ask them, because if I said something on this issue, I would uh, run the risk of uh, supporting conspiracy theories, and on that count I will miss today. Okay, but then let us address one thing vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, conspiracy theories, because... Um, a, you are one of very few outspoken uh, people active in the banking industry talking about the branch protection team. And B, uh, in the past, it has been said that the branch protection team is a conspiracy theory. <laughs> well, it's not. I mean, uh, let's talk about Hank Paulson, who was at the helm of the U.S. Treasury and before that at the helm of Goldman Sachs. And he was uh, stated in an interview, I put that down in my book, Endlich Klartext, finally outspoken, back in 2008. He said, we are hanging uh, around together to uh, organize a common agenda. So there is no conspiracy theory about the Clunch Protection Team. It's true, it's there, and through unusual trading patterns in the historic context, we can implicitly prove that they are active. Yeah, and uh, you said that uh, quantitative easing will continue. Now, uh, since quantitative easing is uh, in uh, full gear, so to say, um, it is not reflected in the price uh, of gold. Why is this the case? Is this um, an indication of the quote-unquote invisible hand of the plunge protection team? <laughs> Well, also, yes. But I think if we talk about gold, we talk about a different issue. Gold is very, it's a barbaric relic, as some people said, um, but it's basically not. It's, it's the only currency that survives the last 5,000 years. And uh, it always works out, in particular, in, uh, in a real crisis. If you were in Moscow back in 1990, gold would pay you everything. In the Argentinian crisis, it would pay you everything. If you're hanging around now somewhere in the Middle East and you have a couple of ounces of gold, it buys you anything, right? So it works. You can't print it. You can try to print it at the comics, but you can't print it in real terms. So what we're talking about is it's a 
basically counter issue to the Western financial system. And in that respect, um, people deal with that from the current system. Um, Paul Volcker, when he was at the helm of the Federal Reserve, went through this iffy issue where gold hit 800 in 1980, and later on he said in interviews the only mistake I made was not to intervene against gold. Now, if we take the um, remarks from um, the finance minister of the UK back in 1999, he said, well, if we didn't intervene back in 1990, we were looking into an abyss. What we can say, take from these remarks from Paul Walker as well as from the um, treasurer of the UK at the time, is that manipulating precious metals markets is part of central bank business today. Would you say people should take a look at the documentation that uh, was gathered by um, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee? Well, I like them. I must say, I think most of what, if you want to find good analysis on, on um, precious metals over the past 15 years, then you should read Gata, then you should read Le Metropole Café, Bill Murphy, etc., etc. It's not that I sign everything they say, but if you compare it to what is being given at analysis at, let's say, the city banks in London or in New York, then the quality of this kind of analysis beats the mainstream analysis by uh, an ex extreme um, percentage. When we are talking about gold and central banks, do you think it is some kind of a fraud that the central banks uh, issue their gold that they hold on the same position um, that they, the gold that they lend out in their um, accounting? Yes. I think the fractional system which we have in, in futures markets is um, very, very critical. We are reaching points at the moment where uh, one physical ounce is being lent out more than 250 times via the comics, right? So on one ounce physically shown in the walls of the comics, you have 250 claims, basically. And we haven't seen anything like that before, and then it spells real danger going forward if you rely on physical deliveries in the comics. And do you think that the physical gold, physical gold of the central banks of the West is in place somehow? Well, uh, if we look at the import statistics by China, for instance, over the last few years, we have to raise our eyebrows, where's all this physical stuff coming from? And in that respect, um, the gold holdings that are, being, that are shown on the balance sheets by central banks um, may not be of that quality they claim it to be. It may very well be paper claims on future productions rather than the, the physical stuff itself down the store. Do you think, for example, uh, that the Deutsche Bundesbank is a good custodian of the German gold uh, um, if it leaves so much gold in New York City? Well, I've got a very good relationship with the Bundesbank, um, to start with that. And uh, mm -hmm. I think they are very wise to get the gold back and I think it's unwise to have such a long period of time until it's being delivered. Gold in this world today um, is an issue where you can issue a new currency on. And I wouldn't like to have that stuff down in somewhere in the US or in London or in Paris. I want it at home. Yeah, and would you say uh, a gold reserve that you do not have in your own possession on, on your old, own soil is no real gold reserve? It's a paper claim, full stop. And given, the, the, given these um, current environment in the precious metal markets, as I said, with a hypothecation of a gold at the COMEX of 1 to 250, given the fact that we know that the physical flows are going into Far East, into the emerging market countries, um, I would be very, very interested as a central banker to get the holdings all back home, full stop. But I know so far that uh, the schedule of uh, which has been 
um, agreed upon by the U.S. and the Bundesbank has been fulfilled and that the quality that has been delivered it has been um, um, checked whether the quality of the gold is there. The quality is fine and uh, so far they met the, uh, the agreement. Okay, thank you very much for this conversation. You're welcome.